Hey everybody, I'm Jared with the Mount St. Helen Institute and I'm your host for tonight's Views and Brews. Um, Mount St. Helens Institute is a nonprofit partner of the Forest Service. Our mission is to advance understanding of the earth through science, education, and exploration of volcanic landscapes. Some of the ways we're doing that is with live virtual field trips to Mount St. Helens. Our education team has been developing an exciting new curriculum for fourth graders. And of course, there's uh, virtual views and brews and, and many other programs. If you'd like to make a donation to these, uh, to keep these programs going, uh, you can visit our website by following the link posted in the event. Uh, the Mount St. Helens Institute is a proud partner of the Cowlitz tribe, and we encourage you, wherever you are, to learn about the indigenous cultures where you live. We operate on the land of the Cowlitz tribes and the confederated bands and tribes of the Yakima Nation. Now, tonight's topic, hiking trails of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, if you have questions during the event, please feel free to ask them in the chat feed and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, tonight's panel, we first have award-winning guidebook author, Craig Romano, uh, environmental photographer, Bart Smith, and author of 21 books, including Hiking Oregon's History, William Sullivan. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for being with us tonight. having some technical difficulties, folks. So hi, Jared. Hey, so, how are you? We got Craig and Bart on. Uh, yeah. So we can start the show here. I'll be glad. <laughs> I think you have to unmute them and. Yeah, I'm uh, having an issue here. Uh, well, he's muted, so let me unmute him. Maybe I can, I can, I can unmute him. I'm unmuted, but I don't see see me. Hey, there comes now. Craig. Okay, can you see me? Can't see you yet. You'll have to click your uh, video, start video thing. Okay, start video. Okay. Uh, I cannot start video because the host stopped it. <laughs> well, oh boy. Um, you should be getting a, a notification okay, asking you to start it. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Ta -da. So Bart's probably in the same, the same position. There we go. Right. Yes, right, so we've got everybody together. And then, so I'm Bill Sullivan, okay. and uh, welcome tonight. We've got three hosts, and that's why it was a little confusing here at first. But uh, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of winter, and you can't really rush up to Mount St. Helens very easily, but this is the time to plan and to look around. And that's exactly what we're going to do to get you ready for the summer hiking season. We've, the three of us have just put together this huge coffee table picture book hiking trails of the Pacific Northwest with gorgeous photos of the, not just Mount St. Helens, some of those too, but also Oregon and Washington, British Columbia, California, um, places you really could go as soon as you were able to. And so uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about, about the two co-authors, Craig Romano, who's known as the Bill Sullivan of Washington. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, <laughs> he's, He's the hiking guidebook author uh, extraordinaire for Washington. I kind of cover the Oregon uh, trails. And then Bart Smith, this incredible photographer who has a story of his own to tell. So let's start with Bart. He's kind of the star of the show, uh, this photographer. And uh, tell us, Bart, when I Google you as a photographer, I come up with the man who hiked tall. But I know you, you're not that tall. I'm told it really is short for them all. What does that mean? The man who hiked them all? Yeah, that, that's right, Bill, thank you. And yes, um, yep, I'm not that tall, you're correct, but I'm the man who hiked all of America's national trail system. 
uh, which is there's uh, 19 National Historic Trails and 11 National Scenic Trails. And uh, in this uh, map here, you can see braided trails. I didn't hike all the braided trails, but I hiked the main routes of all of America's national trails. Uh, and you're wondering, how does that lead up to this book on the um, Pacific Northwest? But it all started when my parents moved from Madison, Wisconsin to the Northwest when I was um, the little one there, the, the six, uh, six years old. And I was just raised in a family that we constantly were hiking all throughout the Pacific Northwest. And my dad loved photography. And so really it was his uh, love of the outdoors um, wore off on me to say the least. And um, as in my twenties, I continued hiking ambitious hikes and I loved uh, sharing them through the lenses. And I figured that, you know, I wanted to do the Pacific Crest Trail. And so I thought, why not carry a 35 millimeter camera with a, a tripod? I knew it was gonna be a lot of weight, but I just, um, Love the, the concept of being able to share my sense of wonder through, uh, th along the trail through film. And I figured that I'd take my time and eventually I'll be able to get enough in, uh, images to interest a publisher. And uh, it took uh, six years, but um, was able to um, get Westcliff Publishers and they contacted Karen Berger. I was very fortunate that she was hiking the trail of the Pacific Coast Trail. She's an author for Backpacker Magazine, she was. So she contributed the text and the book came out in 1998, did really well. So I thought, well, why not try the Appalachian Trail? Maybe this is my calling. So drove across the country and started the Appalachian Trail with a, with a heavy backpack full of camera gear. And once again, just really um, got enthralled with the different experience of the different environments of the East Coast. And uh, it was in 1998, uh, Earl Schaefer, who is the first person credited with walking the Appalachian Trail as a through hike, he did it in 1948. And he was hiking it again in 1998. And I just happened to run into him and we started talking and we ended up collaborating on the book, The Appalachian Trail, Calling Me Back to the Hills. And it was really an honor to work with, um, with Earl and to get to know his family. And the book um, sold really well. So it's like I now had two books published. So I thought, well, let's try the uh, Florida Trail. And I'd never been to the state of Florida in ever. And what better way to uh, learn about a state than walking a, a 1,300 mile trail that covers the entire length of, the Florida, of Florida. And just um, really unique environments once again and, and the wildlife and the birds and the um, reptiles, just fascinating country. So able to get a book published on that. And so then it was onto the Wisconsin Ice Age Trail and it kind of felt like, wow, maybe I could walk all the trails. The Wisconsin uh, Ice Age Trail was actually one of the tougher trails I walked only because the uh, year that I did it, the mosquito hatch was really, really bad. And I had to wear the um, mosquito netting for about three weeks and it was hot. But uh, I returned many times to Wisconsin to get different images through the uh, seasons and was able to get a book on that. And then I thought, okay, maybe I can do all eight National Scenic Trails. So then I walked the Natchez Trace and the Potomac Trail. And then the one trail that um, is so uh, challenging, uh, there's only, I'm only one of other, one other person has walked all of America's uh, national scenic trails. And it's because of the North Country Trail. It's 4,400 miles. So very few people have that much time and energy to walk 4,400 miles. Um, and for me with my uh, camera gear, it was quite a challenge. My wife, Bridgie, had this uh, brilliant idea of putting my backpack on a baby jogger for the roughly 500 miles that cover the, uh, the road walk and the um, rail trails. So I was able to walk the North Country Trail, then it was onto the Continental Divide Trail, where I once again had to carry the big old beast, I call it. And uh, it's funny, you have all these books that they talk about uh, ultralight backpacking. Well, uh, I'm gonna do a book on ultra heavy backpacking, but I don't know if it's gonna sell very well. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, the, the camera gear affords me to share my sense of wonder along the trails. And um, I finished this Continental Divide Trail as a flip-flop here at uh, Yellowstone and then flew that day to Smithsonian National History Museum in DC. And the next day I gave a talk for the 40th anniversary of the signing of the National Trails Act, which was a, a pretty big deal for me. And, um, and then, so I'd done all eight trails, that was my goal. And, uh, and photographed it, photographed it, documented them. Well, then uh, the Obama administration came in and they um, 
and along with uh, legislature, uh, created three new national scenic trails, which was pretty cool. It hadn't been done in 28 years, but they kind of moved the uh, goalposts on me, so to speak. So they had eight, or I had three more trails to walk, which was the Arizona Trail, the um, New England Trail, and here I'm on the Pacific Northwest Trail, which goes from Glacier National Park to the Olympic Coast. And um, here I'm finishing now all 11 national scenic trails. And this is my wife, Bridgie, who I can't um, say enough about how her support for this project is indispensable. I mean, she's half the team. And so the whole time we kind of joke that I, I lived the life of Riley uh, and she's a nurse. And so we've had to do this whole thing on a, on a frayed shoestring, but um, was able to get the book, America's Great Hiking Trails, published uh, through Rizzoli. Uh, Karen Berger provides the, um, the, tech, uh, the, the, yeah, the text. And that book has sold really well. Um, it's won the um, Lowell Thomas Book Award for Best Travel, Mag Best Travel Book of 2015. So that I'd done all the National uh, Scenic Trails. Now I was wondering, what, would it be possible to do all the National Historic Trails? Partly because I had already used the Baby Jogger for some of the trails. So I thought maybe I could do the Historic Trails with a Baby Jogger. And it was just an incredible experience. It worked out much better than I really thought that it could because they're not designed to be hiked as through hikes. Um, so it's, it was a kind of a unique thing to try attempt to do. But um, from 2011 to 2018, I walked and photographically documented uh, America's national historic trails of which as, as I stated earlier, there's 19 of them. Um, and just really, incredible to read the journals of the travelers on all these different trails and then experience the, the scale of the landscape and some of the hardship that they had to deal with. And um, if there's one takeaway from this whole, you know, I've been so fortunate to, to walk 3,000 uh, or 35,000 miles. And, um, and throughout that entire time, I never had a bad uh, experience with anybody, which I don't know if I was fortunate, um, but it's just people were just as kind and generous as can be. And to be able to experience that, I really kind of feel a, a, respons a responsibility to try to give back in some way. But my goal was to do a book on the National Historic Trails and that book just came out um, last year as well. But of all the books I've done, uh, this book on hiking trails of the Pacific Northwest is the one I'm really proud of because it's by where, where I'm from. And um, the images in this book uh, go back um, as far as 20 years ago up till recently. And I've been com uh, comprehensively photographing throughout the Pacific Northwest with uh, four by five and medium format and, um, and uh, now digital. And uh, just look forward to talking about some of the trails that, um, that we're gonna showcase here and just really proud to work with Craig and Bill on this project. Amazing, Bart, the, you really are the man who hiked them all. And now for the guy who writes about the trails in Washington, let's talk about Craig Romano. And yeah. uh, Craig, how did you get started in this business? Well, actually, I didn't start as a hiker. I started as a bicyclist. I grew up in New England, in New Hampshire. My first trips to the Northwest were, were via bicycle. Here I am with Vic Atia in the Oregon State House in April of 1980. And I'm, I'm the grand old age of 18 years old in that picture. And then my second trip, I'm down there, uh, uh, down below and, and taking to the Washington, but I had, I had not hiked here. So I got tired of the roads eventually and discovered hiking, ironically, in my home state. New Hampshire has so many great trails and then wanted to start uh, branching off from there and started hiking other parts of, of North America and the country. And I actually came back out to Washington and started hiking. But I spent some time backpacking uh, in South America. This is in Torres de Paine in Chile before that was um, developed. That's back when Pinochet was still in power. Uh, so I ended up doing a lot of, a lot of backpacking and hiking. Um, I uh, met my wife who used to hold up the South Korean flag there and uh, we did a lot of world, world hiking. So I was in South Korea at one of the national parks. We ended up becoming um, hiking guides in, in Europe. We spent five seasons. Here we are in, in the second highest summit in Bulgaria. We, we hiked in the Pyrenees mostly in that area. So I started, I really wanted to make a living doing, um, hiking how I was going to do that here I am in, in Nevada uh, uh, it's, high, it's highest peak and eventually uh, I, I've been dabbling in writing and the mountaineers contacted me about doing this new series to move on from the the Manning Spring series the day hiking series backpacking uh, my first book on this was the Olympic Peninsula which is my bestseller I love the Olympics 
which is in the West Humpsolips um, River down in, um, in the Olympics. And I started doing the North Cascades out in the Cathedral Lakes here in the Satan Wilderness, backpacking books, ended up writing books covering the entire state, Columbia River Gorge, Eastern Washington, is over near um, uh, Mount Olympus and, and, and part of uh, my the classic hikes book, put that together. Uh, Samuel Priest Wilderness out on the Idaho border, again, covering the whole state. And, and I dabbled, I lived pretty close to British Columbia, did a lot of hiking in BC. One of my books covered covered BC is in Manning Provincial Park in the Kootenay area of BC. So just um, putting it all together, ended up uh, writing, I've done over 25 books now for the Mountaineers. But also in that way, I had two crises on, on the way. Uh, when I turned 50, I became an ultra runner. Here I am, my first 50 mile race over near uh, Mount Rainier. That was uh, how I celebrated my 50th birthday. So I was able to cover miles a lot quicker once I started ultra running. And then my second crisis, um, I ended up oh, here. I'm ultra running again on the Lewis Trail. We're talking about going around there. Great Mount St. Helens, wonderful trail. You know, 32 miles around. Second crisis involved this little guy, Giovanni, my son. I became a dad in my in my 50s, and, and that kind of changed things, uh, changing around too. I, I started to sl I had to slow down on a few of my my trips, but in, in seeing the world in an entirely different place again. And uh, it worked out really well with my next, I started writing these urban trail books, which are more close to, to, the, um, to the city areas. And it worked out well taking him with me. So here's some of the guidebooks I've written, uh, my Olympic number one, here's the urban trail books. My Vancouver, Washington one's the latest one that just came out. So in, 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 in your area down here, it's uh, a lot of fun. My wife's from Vancouver originally, so it's been great to, to spend a lot, a lot of time there exploring Vancouver's areas. Then my classic hikes book, which is a kind of a tribute to Manning and Spring. Um, they, they inspired me and now to, to carry on that torch uh, with, with my books. Hey, well, thank you, Craig. And now, uh, well, let's talk about what I've been doing all these years. Uh, I guess I'm best known nationally as the guy who hiked a thousand miles across Oregon one summer. I wanted to visit all the wilderness areas and naively thought the easy way to do this would be to walk through them all at once. So I went from the westernmost point of the state alone with a backpack to the easternmost point in one summer. And along the way kept this journal of my adventures. So I was held at gunpoint by marijuana growers and poisoned myself with mushrooms. And to this day, it amazes me that people read the journal of this story, listening for coyote, and it makes them want to go hiking. You think it would scare them away. My other adventure memoir is the true story of the log cabin that my wife and I built in Oregon's coast range. There's no road, no electricity, to this day, you have to hike in a mile and a half to get to the cabin. We built it without power tools to prove you could do it the pioneer way with just a crosscut saw and an ax. And that book has become the audible uh, uh, book that you can listen to as a book on uh, in the car. But I, I'm actually a writer. I studied creative writing. So I've done a whole series of murder mysteries set in Oregon. The one in the middle there is the great unsolved mystery of the Northwest. What happened to D.B. Cooper? This guy who parachuted with a quarter million dollars somewhere over Mount St. Helens and has never been found. Well, if he's alive, he'd be in his 70s. And so I have him living in the Portland, Vancouver area incognito and causing no end of mischief. It's kind of a fun read for, um, uh, to take on a light backpacking trip. And then a whole series of historical novels about the Viking age, not hiking, but Vikings. My wife is of Danish background and we speak the language. So they're each about the excavation of an actual Viking ship uh, and the, uh, the Vikings that sailed it uh, a thousand years ago and the archeologists who are digging it up uh, recently. I am a fifth generation Northwesterner. So I take my local history seriously. I've done a book on Oregon's history and how to hike to all these places and one on the natural disasters, floods, fires, earthquakes, volcanoes. Three books that cover the whole state, left to right. They're sort of the advanced guide for, for a backpacking, bushwhacking. The middle one is what my kids call the wussy hiking guide. It's like all in color and has hot springs and bed and breakfast. The one on the right is month by month. Uh, but I'm best known in the state uh, for the 100 Hikes series for Oregon. And these books I update every year or two. I just did a whole new edition for the Portland, Vancouver area that has a dozen new trails and the uh, trails that have been reopened after the Columbia Gorge fires and uh, places to get away from the fires and the crowds. There are now a uh, new permit systems starting in May for most of the trails near Bend and Central Oregon. 
Uh, and so what do you do? Well, you might go to the, not only have a hundred hikes in each of my books, but I have a hundred more at the back of the book. So there's like a thousand trails in Oregon that I cover, and it really does make it possible to get away from the crowds. And that's one of the things we want to talk about here today, as we talk about the hiking trails of the Pacific Northwest, is not just the most gorgeous bucket list trails, but also some of the very beautiful trails that you might have overlooked. Uh, and uh, we, uh, Craig and I kind of helped Bart by giving him ideas about where to go to go uh, take beautiful pictures and find some interesting places. And so let's start with Oregon and I will work with Bart on this. And of course, I assumed that he had lots of pictures of the number one most popular hiking trail, I think in the whole Northwest, certainly in Oregon, Multnomah Falls. So how did you choose which picture to put in the book, Bart? Yeah, that um, it's funny because I actually thought that I, that I had a photograph of Multnomah because I passed it so many times and it's like, but then when I heard that you were doing a um, writing on it and it's like, yeah, you have to have an image of Multnomah Falls, right? So I actually went back and photographed this last February, I mean, essentially almost a year ago. And it was interesting, that was right when COVID was just starting to happen. But um, this is the most recent photograph in the book because it was just this past year. Yeah, and uh, some of them are after the gorge fires. This one was before the Eagle Creek fire in the Columbia Gorge, but it actually looks a lot like this again now uh, because the, uh, the forest has come back very well, surprisingly well from uh, most of the areas in the gorge. But, and you can, you know, that the flowers are back and, uh, but uh, the crowds are gonna come back too. I mean, they've just reopened uh, some of the most popular hikes in the gorge, including here, Eagle Creek, and uh, it's just going to be crowded. For a while they were closed because, the, because of uh, the COVID virus problem, you needed to social distance, and how can you do that when there's thousands of people on the trail? So what can you do to get away from the crowds if you don't wanna do that? Well, you could hike to uh, Mount Jefferson here, Jefferson Park, and this had been a crowded spot, but starting in May, you're going to have to get a permit in advance uh, online, and they will only issue as many permits as there are parking spots at the trailheads and campsites there, so you're guaranteed a campsite. It's a gorgeous spot. Brock, you've been here more than once, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the uh, gems along the Pacific Crest Trail. And so, yeah, I went, um, I've been there about five, five or six times. And it's just every time there's something new to see. And it's not a big place, you know, uh, relatively speaking, but um, it's, it's just a little bit of paradise. This, this image here um, was just an, a, a, a something to witness because it started out as just a, that cloud was just a little wisp. And within several hours, it just blew into this massive thunderstorm, uh, which was really, like I say, something to witness. Um, but unfortunately, it did start, fought, well, it, it's nature, right? And it started a forest fire that burned for uh, months after, afterwards. But yeah, that was something to see. Yeah, and the Jefferson Park area has actually burned twice in the last four years. Uh, so that's part of the story in these areas, too, now, is uh, the fires. And so now... Um, you do are I'm going to need a permit and you're going to have to, you're going to see some uh, burn on the way in, but Jefferson Park itself is an alpine area with very small trees, so it didn't burn and looks just this way still. That's a great spot. But uh, now if you're going to get away from crowds, can you do that at Crater Lake? Yeah, uh, in the summertime, that's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, that's why, I, I mean, so many of these places, I really enjoy going, visiting them this time of year. I mean, right now it's a great time of year to, uh, cross-country ski around Crater Lake, but it's, I mean, you can see why everybody goes there, right? It, I mean, it's just absolutely, you know, one of the wonders of the world, but um, in the summertime, it can be a challenge just because so many people are visiting it, but then, you know, the, it, like so many national parks, there's these trails off to the, you know, white side, like the, this is Sphagnum Bog, which was really a cool little hike. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, it's eight miles in and you wind up in this mosquito infested swamp. <laughs> You've got an amazing picture of it. And on the way to Crater Lake, it's amazing how pe many people drive uh, up the North Umpqua and miss all the waterfalls. There's half a dozen waterfall trails. This one is a half mile hike into Tokatee Falls. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the gems just outside of Crater Lake. 
another way to escape the crowds, ironically, is to go to California. Uh, yeah. Although the Trinity Alps is very heavily used on the southern side toward San Francisco, the side toward Oregon and Washington is pretty quiet. I recommended that you go to the Caribou Lakes, I think, Bart. Yeah, that, that, that's right, Bill. And uh, the whole time I was there for three days, um, I had the whole place to myself. And uh, just, I'd never been to that part of the Trinity Alps. And so really thoroughly enjoyed discovering the, and it reminded me a bit of uh, the Sierras and that has a, you know, the glaciated, um, recently glaciated landscape and um, had the whole place to myself. Except for this deer. How yeah. did, what happened to the deer? How'd you get? Yeah, yeah, the, well, what was crazy was, so I photographed that deer and then later that night, I came back to re, to uh, re-photograph the Mount Shasta, which was for another scene. But when I rounded this band, the deer, I was looking at these um, red eyes it was, it was one of the freakiest things I've ever seen because I was hiking for hours in the dark and then came around the bend and here's this, uh, I didn't know what it was. And then it's like, oh yeah, that's that deer. He's still in the trail. So I don't know what his story was. So now we're going to go up the Oregon coast, uh, which is scenic for many reasons, but just uh, a year or so ago, the Oregon legislature passed a bill to finish the Oregon coast trail. Now here's one of the long range hiking trails that Bart hasn't done yet. And until recently, uh, about a quarter of it was walking along the shoulder of Highway 101, but uh, now they're going to move the trail off the highway. It'll take a few years. Volunteers are doing it and raising money for it and all of that. Um, but uh, soon you're going to have another very spectacular trail and you can already do it, the whole Oregon Coast Trail. Uh, what did you find about it for, for as a photographer? Bob? Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's one of the, destination sites for photographers so you know I just it's one of those places where you can just be there all day and photograph all day and get just um, never enough to uh, daylight in a day to photograph it all it's just so spectacular but I think it is there really is exciting that uh, Oregon's making this new trail I mean it, sometimes it's easy to think that all the trails are built but um, it, it, having this you know, long distance trail on the coast, I think is fantastic. Well, and it helps that we, all of our Oregon beaches are public. So there's 200 miles already done. You have to walk the sand. How do you get the shot of the sun through three arch rocks there by Oceanside? And what was kind of fun for me personally was this is my last day of photographing. I just wanted to get one more shot and there it was, uh, the sun just setting right through the, the arch rock. Um, it was a cave rock maybe. And uh, just with the cloud right above it and uh, just, yeah, spectacular. And so now we'll, we'll say goodbye to the Oregon coast and go east to a mountain range that a lot of people overlook. If they're going to Eastern Oregon, often go backpacking or hiking in the Wallowa Mountains, America's little Switzerland. And, but on the way, you drive right past the Blue Mountains. And I think this picture was from your uh, hike of the Oregon Historic Trail, right? Right, yeah, the Oregon Trail. and. You know, I mean, here again, it's it's interesting to kind of relate with the experience of all those travelers 170 years ago when they saw the blues. It was like one more big obstacle that they had to go over, and they were really afraid that they were going to get snowed in beforehand. But I, when I was walking, I thought there's got to be a trail in the blues, but I'd never heard about it until uh, you mentioned the uh, Elk uh, Elkhorn Crest Trail, which was uh, just really cool. I mean, really thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, it's like 23 miles and they've used dynamite to blast it out of the cliffs. You're almost guaranteed to see mountain goats. They have to put out salt blocks to, so the mountain goats uh, get their salt elsewhere. Otherwise, they gum uh, tents and backpacks and knock them down at night. Uh, but uh, were, were you saying this trail. was going to be part of another long trail? Was, was that this one? You're right, they're working on the uh, Blue Mountain Trail that will go all the way from Joseph in the Wallowas to John Day uh, by the Strawberry Mountain Wilderness. And when you went to Strawberry Mountain, you took a picture of this trail, just a trail at the start. Why? Well, I don't know if you ever get this feeling that everything's 
smiling at you, but I just felt like the trail was smiling at me there. So because I just wanted like to photograph face. it. To, uh, yeah, it's just whimsical. I always, I love photographing anything that's whimsical. And it's like, wow, those that look like that trail was, uh, the, the roots were smiling. And then up here, this is a strawberry lake and uh, just one of those beautiful Zen-like evenings, uh, calm as can be. And then there's just a little bit of a, a, a um, fish rising there. And uh, just what I love with photography is capturing Zen moments. Yeah, yeah, it's like a little piece of the Canadian Rockies dropped in the middle of Eastern Oregon. Uh, more typical of Eastern Oregon would be Steens Mountain, this huge fault block mountain in Southeast Oregon uh, where apparently you found uh, bighorn sheep. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and you know, if, if anybody wants to go to Alaska, but they don't have uh, the time or money, I mean, the Steen Mountain area is, it's like uh, visiting another part of the country. To, for me, it was, this is the first time I've been to the Steens. I always wanted to go to Steen Mountain. And uh, yeah, with the bighorn uh, sheep was, was just really cool to see. And just the, such a wide open windswept, just a wild part of the, you know, the lower 48. Yeah, it's, it's the highest road in Oregon. You can drive to 9,500 feet, and then it's a stroll up to the summit. And then you're looking down at this hanging valley of Wild Horse Lake and actually can see five states at once there because you can see all the way across Idaho to the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. But if you think this is wild, uh, try the far side. That's in the rain shadow of Steens Mountain is the Albord Desert. And it's a wilderness study area, but it is possible to drive across this, uh, this salt flat and get to a trail that was not built by human beings. So um, I think I recommended this one as well, that you go see an alien trail in an alien place. If it wasn't built by humans, who built this trail? Well, I wouldn't have known unless you had told me that it was wild horses, but I, I believe it's wild horses. <laughs> yeah, the right? wild horses wild. are yeah. going through big sand gap here to get to a spring. Uh, and so they build, a, it's kind of a braided trail, but a perfectly hikeable one, pretty wild. Even wilder yet is to the east of the Owyhee Canyonlands. There have been several efforts to make this a national monument or a wilderness, but it has almost no protection other than one small state park there at Leslie Gulch, uh, which I recommended you see as sort of a sample of this huge wild area. What did you find there? And, yeah, and, and you know, from a photographic perspective, less well, the whole area, but Leslie Gulch um, was just with the er eroded, uh, unique, um, with the lighting and the erosion, it's just a, a really cool place to explore. Yeah. Leslie Gulch, yeah, and there are several, right. and, um, there are several different uh, canyons you could go into, and each one had a different character to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, another spot that's kind of closer to civilization near Bend is Fort Rock. And this is, looks like a fortress in the desert. It's actually a volcanic explosion crater that was eroded by a, a cliff, uh, but it's uh, isolated out in the desert. And uh, I, I think you took a heavy camera there. Right. Yeah, this yeah this was uh, along with a number of the images you're saying it was taken with four by five film camera. Um, so yeah, bringing the uh, and it's just to be up there with the, uh, the curtain over your head and um, it's just a really fun place to photograph. But geologically, what a what a fascinating place! And you can really appreciate how it was once an island in this vast lake. Um, but really cool place to to explore. a lot of a lot of uh, volcanism in this area right near it is crack in the ground uh, where a lava flow cracked and left this two mile long slot that you can hike through. I think uh, I sent you there too, Bart. Yeah, yeah. And, and here again, it, it's you could kind of call it maybe a novelty hike, for, but for expo I, I love exploring and just uh, a, a really cool place to spend about two hours just uh, going in and exploring. And it's very, um, has its own ambiance, its own atmosphere. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah, in Christmas Valley and uh, yeah, really cool place. Yeah, it's even got its own climate because it, it's uh, cooler down there, even when it's hot in the desert. So that kind of wraps up our tour of Oregon and Northern California and some of the uh, bucket list places, but also less known spots. And now I'm going to turn it over to Craig and Bart to tell us about Washington and British Columbia. Why on earth did you start with a picture of Mount Rainier, Craig? 
Well, I mean, it's the most iconic peak in the Northwest. I mean, in, in Washington, you can see it from practically everywhere. And I've seen it from Vancouver, too, at Vancouver Lake. So, um, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, it's a bucket list to climb, but the hiking there is incredible. As, uh, as Bart can tell you, um, with the Wonderland Trail going around and then, the, you know, all the environmental um, meadows are incredible, the old growth forest. So, so Bart, what's some of your favorite aspects of, of Mount Rainier? Well, I mean, every, every side of the mountain has its own characteristic and, you know, I've never been able to do the one Wonderland Trail. I haven't been able to get all the permits for it. But, um, you know, you can do day hikes in and out on every side of the mountain. But the Wonderland Trail is on my, on my list. I hope to do that uh, one of these years. But it is getting crowded. I mean, Mount Rainier is getting crowded. There's no, no uh, way around that. But with Mount St. Helens, um, it's uh, much less visited, certainly, than Mount, uh, Mount Rainier. But um, this image here, what was fascinating to me, this was taken in 2000, I took this in 2004. And um, what, what was, just kind of blew my mind was they were, uh, on the news they were saying that the, they thought that might erupt at like 7 a.m. in the morning. I mean, they actually gave a time. And so I was at a place called Sawtooth Ridge. I thought that might be a good vantage point. And it's like, right at within a couple minutes of 7 a.m. a puff, puff came out and then uh, within the it was about an hour and a half eruption and uh, just one of the more incredible things I've ever witnessed to, to be so near it um, and uh, and this image was taken uh, on the day uh, I want to say 20 years after the eruption and you can just see a little bit of life coming back but um, it's so cool that uh, you have this group that takes care of the that looks after Mount St. Helens because it is such a fascinating part of our uh, northwest. What's, what's incredible about St. Helens too I got to see it one month before it blew I was on my first cross-country bicycle trip and of course all my family back east are like you're not going to go see that it's, it's going to erupt and I got to see it a few weeks before it erupted and then nine years later when I came out here I got to hike it and it's just incredible every year more and more light keeps coming back to it it's just unbelievable to watch all the light come back. It is. Yeah. No when, when I was when I was growing up, I thought, oh, I'm going to keep I'm, I'm going to climb that mountain one of these days. And then it blew up and it, it was too late. You, you couldn't I mean, you couldn't go to that old summit anymore. But it did change some other things like it stripped out Lava Canyon here and left a trail that's actually fairly dangerous. If you're not careful, they've had a fatality there. Um, but this was created this area uh, exposed by the eruption. Well, next, I think you're going to take us to some urban trails. Yeah, this is uh, this is within 15 miles of my house, and I think it's so cool to see how uh, urban trails have become so popular through the through the last 20 years or so. But this trail, Snake Lake, it's it's like I say, I go there all the time when I just want to do some photography, and and it's right in the middle of Tacoma, and it just surprises me how much wildlife you can still see. You know, bird, you know, not big wildlife, obviously, but just the urban trails throughout the the Pacific Northwest were just blessed. Uh, th this is um, on uh, Larrabee uh, State Park, and so it's only a few miles from Bellingham. Yeah, and this is my backyard. I spent a lot of time over here trail running and, and again just having these trails so accessible to us can't always get out to you know to, to the back country but when we can i think Bart, uh, you have uh, mount baker set up next for you know you can see get lots of great views of mount baker from the chucking up mountains here yeah yeah and this um so yeah so from the urban trails this, this was a trail uh, artist's viewpoint which i thought might be kind of fun just because we're in the winter time now I mean, it, it's tough to me. I mean, this would be my selection for the best winter hike in the Northwest and you know, more cross country skiing, obviously. But um, within just a small area, you're between Mount Shuxan and Mount um, Baker and just wide open country. And just um, for anybody who's, you know, wants to do a winter hike, uh, if, if the weather's good, you, you can't beat it. I think it's actually erupting a little bit. You have to be careful of avalanches though. Yeah. Yeah. You can see some smoke coming out there from the Yeah, from yeah, that's yeah, Mount Baker's erupting too. Yeah, we yeah, it's it's easy to you know forget that we live in a really active part of the world. So geologically active. Well, now for something completely different, uh, switch from winter trails to spring. Where yeah, spring, yeah. I mean, it's only what uh three months away and this in April, you know, you can still have 10, 12 feet of snow in the Cascades where 
here at uh, in Eastern Washington at uh, Dry Falls State Park. Um, just a fascinating place to explore and you can take your family and kids and uh, really highly recommended. And this yeah, is the, where uh, the, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, see, the home. Sage Step area is it's just amazing. A lot of people overlook in Washington, uh, especially if they just drive across I-90. They have no idea that this, these Channel Scablands, these coolies are out there and, and they offer some great quiet hiking and wonderful springtime hiking, as, as you know. Yeah, I, I've loved exploring the, uh, the Eastern Washington. That's like a whole new area for me. And another area is uh, here in um, West, in um, Vancouver Island, uh, the Strathcona Provincial Park, uh, the Strathcona Mountains. Um, I, I'd never heard of that. And this is where, this is where Craig recommended me visiting this and what a cool place. Uh, this is called Flower Ridge. Um, and uh, the whole Strathcona is, they're tough. I mean, it's a challenging mountain range. Really, really tough. You know, this is the largest provincial park on Vancouver Island, over a half a million acres. It's also a BC's uh, first provincial park. Doesn't, you know, a lot of people uh, don't know it's there, like you, like you said, and uh, it's tough. You're starting at sea level to get up into these 5,000 foot peaks. It, it, it's grueling. It's like, like the gorge going up Mount Deception. I'm not defiant stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it reminded me of the Cascades. Uh, now here we go on the, here we're at the West Coast Trail and um, I wasn't able to get the permits for it. Um, didn't, uh, I should have done that in advance, but I did, uh, was able to section hike in there. And I was just amazed at how many people from around the world are hiking this trail. I mean, it's really got a world renowned um, uh, base of people interested in it and from for Canadians I mean it's almost like a uh, rites of passage or something to walk the west coast trail but it was I was surprised how challenging it was physically and interesting enough that trail was built um, not for hikers it was built for shipwrecks the, the, the Canadian Coast Guard built it over 100 years ago ship ships would, would crash off the coast and, and the survivors had to hike out of there so uh, it's got a fascinating history and then just um, what would it be east, southeast of there, I mean, immediately, um, you can go the other direction and walk on the, uh, the Juan, de, uh, Juan de Fuca Strait. And the Juan de Fuca Trail is, uh, you don't have to have a permit, so I was able to walk that. And a beautiful, sublime, um, really, really fun hike. Yeah, it connects uh, several provincial parts. You can get camp there, car camp, and do sections. Great family-friendly trail. And just across the uh, Juan de Fuca, now we're in the Olympics, which is my favorite place in the world. I'm not afraid to say. <laughs> but uh, the lake down there is La Crosse Basin. And I went there because I was told that there might be a uh, bear. And oh my gosh, this is in September. And we saw about 20 bear, but a uh, black bear. Um, but they're so intent on eating as much of the uh, blueberries, huckleberries, that they really show very little interest in, uh, in, in the hikers and um uh, but what a wild place i mean there we saw elk um mountain goat coyote and uh just a really cool uh, little spot of heaven of serengeti in the olympics yeah lake, lake lacrosse is one of my favorite places just one of my 100 classic hikes the shortest way in there is 20 miles and exactly what you said wow my record for most bears seen in one hike is in that basin just an incredible place now we go across the, uh, the Cascades to the Pesaten Wilderness area, it's the Boundary Trail. And uh, it's, I've hiked the Boundary Trail twice and it's now become part of the uh, Pacific Northwest Trail. So more people are, are walking it, um, but uh, it's still, still a fairly remote area. And um, I don't know if there's any uh, fishermen in our, in our audience here, but the uh, cutthroat at uh, Cathedral Lakes was fantastic when I went through there for, for fly fishing. This place is absolutely stunning in October, the, the, the largest, and it's another one, it's 20, it's 18 miles to get in there. It's not an easy hike to get in. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a long distance hike where you, you can be uh, like 10 days, you can spend 10 days. And if you coordinate it, you can actually take the ferry, have the ferry pick you up, by, I think it was Lightning Creek Campground and then take you off to take you to the other side of uh, Ross Lake and then you can continue on. 
And now here we're uh, on the uh, Rialto Beach. And so we covered the, uh, the coast of Oregon, but I mean, I mean, we're so blessed in the Northwest with our coastline I and mean, we got to include, you know, some of the coasts from Washington. And uh, so from Rialto Beach to uh, Cape Alava um, was just one of my favorite places in the world. And um, the year, or the, um, that section of trail is also part of the Pacific Northwest Trail. And when I took this image here, it was on the last day of me completing all 11 of the National Scenic Trails. And I had this sensation that, well, like, wow, am I gonna be able to hike again? <laughs> I mean, it was silly, it didn't make sense. But I remember I was having a hard time focusing on this image because I was basically tearing up thinking, wow, I'm, I'm gonna finally be done with this whole thing. Now, what am I gonna do? But I ended up walking all the historic trails after that. So, but um, just a beautiful part of the country is the um, Washington coast. And this is a Hearts, Hearts Pass area. And, uh, and you, know, so you know about that, Craig? Yeah, this is the highest um, public road in Washington. You can drive up to 7,400 feet. It's got a white knuckle spot near a place called Dead Horse Point. So uh, you want to just uh, not look down. Uh, a lot of people get a little freaked out there. But once you get up there, it is, it's amazing. It's going to put you at access at 6,000 feet to, to go along these ridge lines and, and larches and the state wilderness. And it's a, an amazing place. It's got some really nice uh, car camping areas up there. Uh, stargazing. You, you've got a dark sky up there. It's a great place to be up there at night. And, and if you can time it to be on a nice day in October, you know, can't beat it. It's just absolutely spectacular. And it was, and, and is only uh, a few miles from where I started, my north, uh, my southbound of the Pacific, North Pacific Crest Trail, which started this whole thing of walking America's National Scenic Trails, Historic Trails, and the Trails of the Pacific Northwest. Wow, what a, what a journey. Uh, and now you're, you don't have to cry about not being able to hike uh, these trails again, because you can still go. <laughs> and, uh, people say, well, aren't, are you still hiking? And go, well, yes, <laughs> this is like, um, paid to go hiking? What kind of a job is that? I tell people it has its ups and downs. Uh, <laughs> woo, yeah. So, uh, so that's our program about uh, hiking trails of the Pacific Northwest and the, this four pound coffee table book of Bart's photography and the text of uh, Craig and me uh, telling about some of the, not just the most beautiful spots, but also the most, the prettiest places you don't know about. Uh, so th thanks for taking an evening off from just focusing on Mount St. Helens and expanding your view just a little bit so that you can plan ahead for this summer and uh, the trails that you can do once this, uh, you get your vaccinated and, and you can get out and, and get hiking again. Uh, so that's our program, Jared. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, you have time for a couple of questions? Of course. If you've got them. Yeah, um, so I got one for each of you and then one for all of you, if that's all right. Um, so Bill, uh, you wrote a lot of books. I was curious, what book did you find the most interesting to write? Whoa, ah, the most interesting. Well, it's usually the most recent one. <laughs> that is actually about the Swedish Vikings of all things. Oh. Who knew that Sweden uh, besieged and uh, nearly conquered Constantinople in the year 907. Oh, wow. Well. And that the greatest Viking grave in Sweden uh, that they have thought of as a the Viking warrior par excellence for all these years turns out to be female <laughs> with all of everything. So I've been uh, reading Swedish and getting into that. Uh, that's what you do, I guess, when you're stuck uh, with the virus and uh, in the snow and you can't go out hiking. But I'm also updating my Eastern Oregon and Southern Oregon book and all the others and be back on the trail soon. And then that's all I'll be focused on is the next hiking trail and book. Very cool. Um, Craig, you've, you've been on so many hikes and uh, just all over the place. And I guess, you know, there's a lot of people right now in the pandemic who are itching to get out and they're not really sure how to do it. And I was curious, do you have any tips for beginner hikers? Oh, for beginner hikers. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the number one things, obviously, uh, people, a lot of people today are finding 
picture, they're finding trails by a pretty picture on the internet. And, you know, that certainly entices people, but you've got to know where you're going, what you're doing. Obviously, Bill and I write great sources. You know, you want to do a little research on the trail uh, so you know what you're getting yourself into because three miles around, three miles on the Salmon Creek Trail in Vancouver is not going to be the same thing as three miles in the backcountry. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowing about conditions, and especially right now, a lot of people, uh, you know, winter's harsh in the, in the Northwest in the high country. You have avalanche danger yeah. and, you know, well, rivers to worry about and everything. Uh, so you got to be really careful there. There's a lot, a, a lot of trails that are just not open this time of year. But the same token with the gorge and a lot of the urban trails, you have access to so many trails um, year round and it's wonderful. So definitely start on some of the easier trails. Uh, again, the urban trails are, are perfect for that. Uh, some of the nature trails, um, you know, be prepared, you know, all, all the time, having the right gear and, 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 and knowing the trail, good maps, good books, good resources. So that, I find that's one of the number one uh, problem that people are getting into. They're just heading out without any, any background knowledge and you can get into trouble really quickly and, and it can turn, yeah. it can get really bad. So, um, so that, that's my, 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 my biggest advice is definitely do the research before you head out. And I'll tell you, you'll have so much of a better uh, experience, you know, when you're prepared than uh, having things go, go bad. So, so that, that's my advice on, on getting out. And, and, and this is a great time. More and more people are discovering outdoors. It's wonderful. Um, it's access to so many different trails and you don't have to go all the way to St. Helens or Mount Hood or, or Rainier. You've got stuff that's just a couple of miles uh, closer. And I'm hoping that all these new hikers too are going to rally, uh, you know, Congress and state legislatures to, to protect even more land and get even more trails. So it has definitely a positive side to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Bart, uh, people want to know, would you recommend a career as a wildlife or nature photographer? <laughs> yeah, Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, but I, I mean, it depends on each person, but I mean, there's no way that, I, well, I should, should say, I, I still to this day have yet to really make a, a good positive income, but there's no way I would want to there's no way, not enough money that could pay for all the experiences of, that I've had. Um, but that said, it's, I mean, if you really want to be a, a, a professional photographer, um, there really are, you got to be prepared to have big sacrifices. I mean, that kind of comes with the territory. Um, but there's no way that I'd want to give up what I've done. So I, I don't yeah. know if that answers it. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. Um, and I guess you kind of already answered this one in uh, the presentation part. You said the Olympics, but uh, what is everyone else's like? What are your favorite spots to explore? Where's your favorite place that you've like been? Um, one of my favorite places is, is, and we write about it in the book, is in northeastern Washington, the Samuel Priest Wilderness, the Kettle Mountains. One of the things I like about the kettles are the oldest mountains in Washington. They look a lot like the Appalachians, and I grew up back east, so so I, I have that kind of attraction to them. But they're wild. It has the megafauna. There's uh, an area there's grizzly bears still in the area. Lynx, uh, not crowded. Uh, the Kettle Crest Trail is 44 miles long. It, it's just one of my favorite trails. Uh, yeah, this this place that you just got to get away. You know, get away from Seattle and Vancouver, BC, and Portland. And maybe not the iconic place of the Rainiers, but there's some of these other places that you're going to have these wilderness experience. So I love Northeastern Washington. Well, I get this question so often that I wrote a whole book about it called Oregon Favorites. And the trick is that it's uh, arranged by month. So every mm -hmm. month of the year, I recommend trails that are at their peak then. And this really matters because your favorite trail from August is no good in January. You, uh, and the same, it, it goes the other way. So uh, you want to get there when the mosquitoes are gone and when the wildfire flowers are blooming. And uh, the trick really is you're the favorite to pick the right season for it. Um, that's one of the tricks. Anyway, trick I use. That's good advice. Bart, do you have a second, a second favorite place to explore? Well, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's favorite, but I mean, just some that at this time uh, that I, I love exploration. I like, I love seeing new places, and really, um, east, both the eastern part of Oregon and Washington, um, all throughout. I just really want to return and and revisit a lot of those um, places. They're usually they're not long hikes more than anything, but it's just. Um, I love exploration and it's areas that I haven't seen yet. 
Very cool. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for coming. Um, it was very nice to have you. Um, for those of you at home, our next Views and Brews will be presented by Northwest Avalanche Center. It'll be an avalanche course. Um, you know, Craig mentioned that earlier that those are a danger right now. Uh, so it'll be a good one to attend in February. Uh, Speaking of favorite places to explore, I guess I would say mine is Mount St. Helens. And if you're interested in getting out and exploring it, we do offer guided programs year round. You can find more on our website at mshinstitute.org. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming. Great. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy trails. Happy trails.